friends, we're in a fair way to be in trouble. Because we have to make a series of comparisons which may be very confusing. And if a general confusion results, we will be in a completely scientific attitude. <laughs> because that is exactly the way the matter is. We now come to somewhat of a parting of the ways between what we may term uh, materialistic knowledge and the esoteric teachings of ancient peoples. We want to be a little careful, however, in evaluating not only this division or separation of concepts, but attempt to determine, if possible, whether this is really a division or whether it is an impact upon prejudice viewpoints which makes reconciliation difficult without adequate thoughtfulness. This evening we have to deal with the problem of the rise of development of races. And we are already in trouble when we actually announce the subject. For this reason, we seldom have ever paused to wonder how the anthropologist uses the term race in the processes of his classification and investigation. First of all, he clearly tells us that the words that he uses to represent racial differentiation are completely arbitrary. They are signs and symbols by means of which others of similar minds may discover what he is attempting to convey. The term race today has probably only one basic meaning, and that is the human race. About this, there seems to be no general difference of opinion. From this point on, everything becomes less certain. Actually, philosophy, religion, ancient concepts of culture assume the existence of a primordial humanity. A humanity as yet undifferentiated into the racial divisions that we commonly refer to. This total humanity forms a kind of archetypal or collective being. The anthropos. Uh, the, the total selfness of humanity. Where this can be placed in chronology or in geographical location has not been firmly resolved. Perhaps the only geographical area large enough to contain the concept of race is the earth itself. For race transcends all boundaries of continents and areas. Perhaps the only time, chronological sequence, large enough to envelop this subject adequately, is simply all time, which has elapsed since the development of a human species in nature. Thus, what we term race today should convey something of the total concept of human beings. It should remind us that humanity is a kind in nature, that it is ultimately a total kind. Actually, from the standpoint of genetics, there is less than 1% variance among all human beings. Thus, what we term uh, variety or variance arises not in the phenomenon of nature, but in the cultural experience of man himself. Allowing, therefore, that there is a collective mankind, we can then follow the Pythagorean concept. The division never divides a collective. The division always exists within a collective. Therefore, Various divisions can arise within humanity, but this does not mean that humanity is divided. 
It means that in 99% of the essentials of our nature, we are always one creature. And that this 1% becomes overly important to us, largely because of our interpretation and our addiction to things seen rather than to things known uh, factually or philosophically. There is much to assume, therefore, at the beginning of our experience in person that there was a common race. There is also much to tell us that this common race is no longer visible to us. It, is, it has ceased to be visible because it has been submerged as far as its appearances are concerned in the divisions which have arisen within it. This does not mean that this primordial race ceases. Rather, that this primordial race continues as the, as the pure substance of race. And that from and within this substance an infinite diversification takes place. The ancient Aryan Hindus tell us that there was an ancient race, a race that preceded all known races. But this is that race vanished in the dawn of things. But this race was composed of beings that were to disappear into the life ways of their own descendants, or those that descended from them in terms of racial differentiation. But there must have been a hypothetical first race, we must assume. There has to be a first of anything that has a beginning. But instead of imagining that this first is an individual or a group of individuals, the ancient Hindu scholars assumed that this first was the total that this first was a kind of vast architect's plan, a living plan, incorporated into substances, developing according to an almost incredible span of time and an almost infinite diversification. Thus the first race never died, because there can be and never has been but one race. This race, however, passes from our recognition, passes from our phenomenal uh, contact, because it is disappearing constantly into the structure of the races which are produced from it. This concept is not actually in variance with basic anthropological thinking. It may represent, however, an angle or approach to the subject and which has not been given as much consideration as certain other sub subjects. I would say that the anthropologist today is more dis interested in discovering a unity than in realizing that it has always existed. Of course, he is unconsciously and instinctively admitting its existence, or he would not be able to search for it or believe that he could find it. Now, the next point that we have to bear in mind in this consideration is that in modern terms, in the terms of living people, anthropology deals only with things as they are now. It may attempt to extend certain of its reflections into causes, causes rather of how than of why. It may also seek to extend itself into the future to make its utilitarian contribution to the progress of culture. But essentially, uh, the anthropologist, and the, or for that matter, all of us, think in terms of the immediate. Therefore, our concept of man is our concept of man as he is now distributed about the earth with the division, social, religious, cultural, racial, that we now recognize. Yet in arriving at such terms as we presently use, we should bear in mind the fact that these terms are geared only to the contemporary, and the anthropologist is the first person to admit this. 
he realizes that he is not talking about all time. He is talking about only those familiar parts of time which are within his present examination. And he is using things as they are as a kind of symbol by means of which he hopes to clarify his primary end, namely cultural enlightenment on the subject of man, not of any particular man or group of men, but of man as a collective. If we assume for a moment that which he will have trouble in denying, that there was a common humanity, this common humanity is a kind of being, a person, growing up very much as the human body develops. And within this human body of ours, there are an infinite number of parts. These parts down to the smallest division, cellular structure, are still essential to the total concept of the human body. Therefore, the total body human of society is an entity or a unity composed of an infinite diversity of Anthropology is concerned to a degree to determine if possible the basic reason for this diversity. Actually, he hasn't done too well, and he is among the first to realize that he has not done too well. It is hard for him to do uh, as he would like to do, for the simple reason that the evidence necessary has been obliterated in the aeons of time that have already passed over and about which we have no adequate record. Man began as a non-recording creature. Therefore, up to the time of the discovery of a method or means for the transmission of knowledge, we have no adequate continuity of account concerning man. We do have, as has been mentioned previously, two possible streams of evidence. One, tradition, legend, myth, lore, which have descended as part of the cultural heritage of mankind. The other is man's internal repository of intuition, of instinct, of the power to dream or to visualize. And modern psychology is beginning to recognize the reemergence of the archaic or the ancient through the symbolic processes of human thinking. Thus, man has the whole story of his kind locked within himself. And this story of his kind, he lives out every day of his existence. And the primary impulses and instincts which move him today derive from the primary instincts and impulses which primordially move his kind. And we find these impulses now rather dramatically and dramatically expressed for us in terms of security, peace, fellowship, friendship, integrity, honor. And these subtle processes which arise within the individual. We must not, however, ever confuse the impulse of honor, for example, with the concept of the honorable. They are two entirely distinct things. On, uh, the honorable expresses itself through innumerable codes which may be uh, proper to one people and improper to another. But the instinct to attain to certain levels of accepted conduct must be regarded as basic. At the same time that we proceed with this line of thinking, it is interesting to pause and consider something else because there is no doubt in the world but the study of languages parallels very closely the study of mankind. In the first place, at some very remote time, man became vocally articulate. How he became so is again uncertain. Perhaps we have some key to it in the mimicry of certain birds and animals that copy other sounds and do so originally and primarily for purposes of survival, although this has no longer its original importance. 
that man began by communicating ideas by sounds originally associated with those ideas. Perhaps is our most natural conclusion. Therefore, when man instinctively wept because of sadness, he made certain sounds, and he was later able to copy those sounds to express that, even though at the moment he was not weeping. He might in one way or another also associate sounds with activities, with places, and with various procedures in living. But in the course of time, there arose in the primordial human group a primordial human language. This human language, like the group itself, has disappeared. Perhaps it had something to do with the ancient free Sanskrit language of India, sometimes referred to as Sansa, or the language of the gods. Very often, uh, we uh, create mythological concepts uh, to express this uh, problem. But we are in now one very simple position, that in language as in race, we begin with an archetype. We begin with a total language, and what we know as languages arise from the total language. There were certain common words, words that arose in the prehistory of man. And out of these, there came into existence an extremely flexible vocabulary long before a man had any written form whatsoever. Some may wonder just to what degree this vocabulary was universal. I think we probably will find that it was universal in its beginning. And like all other things in nature, it drifts from a universal to a particular condition. In all probability, these primordial sounds, like certain primordial ideas, which are distributed throughout mankind, arose from such simple natural phenomena that most peoples either held them in common or were able to recognize them when others made use of them. That this language should die, disappear, vanish from the face of the earth, is not reasonable or proper, any more than that the first race of men should vanish from the earth. What happened was that this language became submerged. It was submerged within and behind languages. So that we cannot actually say with certainty that any language spoken by man today was first although almost all ancient cultures claim a certain priority for their own. Actually, the first language has disappeared into all others, just as the first race has vanished into all others. The proof of this, of course, lies in the most ancient and basic terms and words that we know. In old days, men made a great study of comparative words, and where they found the easiest, and most available supply of these words was in religion. They found especially in the great ancient Sargic documents, in the great epics of their people, in their great scriptural writings, in their myths and legends, and possibly most essentially in the names of their deities, one very common source or common ground. Another very common and natural ground, as we might suspect, was the name of foods, various food elements. The names for most common and simple things, most anciently known, were the words that still survive, hidden in the extensive vocabularies that have later developed. We think it is interesting to find, for instance, the name of a Greek deity, traceable in India, or the name of an Egyptian god, paralleled in America. We begin to think that the possibility is that migrations account for this. Perhaps to a measure they do on a secondary level of later events. But primarily, these words are kind of root words from mother languages. They have passed through various modifications which the students of this subject can handle. But actually, we have evidence of a common spoken language. A language which may have been inadequate to the specialization of people, so that it vanished from our notice as specialization proceeded. 
and particular and special things required more and more attention. But in this specialization, attention being constantly turned to the new, the old was left pretty much alone. Therefore, it is in the oldest and most basic words that the common language is most easily traced. Although we cannot hope to restore it entirely, we know it was there, just as there was a common humanity that undoubtedly made use of it in the dawn of things. This common language was extinct, or at least submerged to the point where it was no longer noticeable, before the invention of writing. And also, we are possessed of very little knowledge of its sound, because no man has ever heard it. It was not spoken uh, in historic times. And even had it been, we would not be able uh, to be certain that it has descended to us. We have tried for many years to restore the Pythagorean loop, but we cannot do so because no one has ever heard it. The living person has not heard it, so he does not know arbitrarily what its sounds might be. We can follow the formulas used by such records as we know and attempt to reconstruct it, but we can never be certain that the tones we form are identical with those that Pythagoras created. We have no way of knowing because we cannot hear those sounds. Thus so many things are dim and dark to us because we can no longer participate in them. But we have to consider them merely as hypothetical reconstructions. And this is the situation we are in, a very large part of our cultural problem. Also, we know human habits are rather interesting things. And today, for instance, when we speak of ancient <coughs> people, we never, or practically never, speak in mind of anthropology or biological situations. When we say the ancient Greeks, we never begin in our mind to measure stones or anything of that nature, because the ancient Greek to us is a cultural entity, not a racial entity. A Greek is someone in a toga who said certain things, did certain things. He was an artist, a scholar, a mathematician, a philosopher, a warrior. When we think back upon ancient Greece, there is nothing less important to us than the biological aspects of Grecian life. We have no interest in it. When we think of the Romans, we are not attempting to determine the difference between a Roman and a Syrian. We are not at all concerned. To us, a Roman is a soldier, a legislator, an emperor, a despot, perhaps, an adventurer, a conqueror. But he is not a biological entity. And the same is true today in viewing practically all cultures that we know, except for a small group of specialists who are searching, searching constantly for missing links in the descent of man all peoples are now divided according to their cultures, recognized and admired according to their cultures, or reproved because of the defects of their cultures. We no longer think of them in terms of their genes, but in terms of their genius, and it's just as well, probably. On this basis also, uh, we must recognize that essentially the development of race is marked by the development of culture. Development has no essential meaning to us except in terms of culture. We think of the physical structure as underlying culture. If the Greek hadn't lived, if he hadn't had arms and legs, he would not have been able to be a scholar, a philosopher, or an artist. We assume his biological capacity for the things which he achieved. But we make little moment of it and pass on immediately to matters of some greater concern. It is the same of individuals. We are quite certain that Plato was weaned at one time, but no one cares. No one is at all concerned with the fact that Plato probably passed through the childhood diseases and may have been a slight problem to his relatives in his infancy. 
These things mean nothing. We are interested totally and solely in the man as a cultural unit and the effect which he had upon his own time and upon all time subsequent. It is the same in the study of humanity. The infancy of man with its innumerable problems are re is really of very little interest to us. What we are trying to discover constantly is not the story of man's biological growth, but the record of man's achievement, as this achievement affected his own time and affects our time. Uh, thus, under certain covers, uh, we sometimes misrepresent our own point of view. And we make another very serious mistake when we attempt to bind culture to biology. In other words, if we should go so far as to say that a Greek attained his culture merely because of his biological existence, we would be uh, getting ourselves into a serious situation. When the Greek becomes a symbol of culture, as it has so become, it is a symbol of an attainment, not of a biological situation. So we have to watch carefully that we do not assume that certain racial problems must inevitably be involved deeply in cultural problems. In our modern researches, we know that this fallacy can lead to the gravest misunderstandings and miscomprehensions in general. The next point that perhaps we should attempt to consider is what we know as the account of the descent of races. Today, we have established what might be called a tripod. Humanity following, perhaps, the ancient doctrines of revelation. The human family, in our present experience, not considering at the moment such races and such experiences as have passed so long in limbo that we cannot even reconstruct them, we seem to find a trinity arising within the racial structure of man, just as it arose in his religion and philosophy. This trinity presents us with a threefold enclosure, which is valuable only because it represents the extreme boundaries of something. It does not tell us anything particularly about the contents, but it does bound an area and give us a certain point upon which to work. Therefore, we consider the variable of mankind as contained within a triangular frame consisting of three basic types of humanity, recognized as surviving now and also recognized as having descended from a very great antiquity. These are the three races with which we today seek to identify all human beings, namely the Caucasoid or Caucasian, the Mongoloid or Mongolian, and the Negroid or Negro. We regard these not as telling us anything, except that they form a framework. And if you extend a human type in any direction to its ultimate, as far as we can do under existing conditions, we cannot extend it beyond the framework of these three basic demarcations. We cannot find anything outside of them. But we do not have quite as easy a time when we begin to look inside of the wall. The, the wall is convenient, it is comparatively meaningless, yet it does help us to a certain degree. Now, because of the fact that we have only a very limited time, we cannot go into all the ramifications of this subject, but let us give a symbolic example of exactly what we mean when we say that these boundaries are exceedingly abstract and elusive. Let us take a race with which we have considerable immediate and continuous contact, the Caucasoid or Caucasian race. Now, what are we dealing with? Well, the first thing that most people will say is, well, we're now dealing with the white race. That's the first mistake. We are not. Well, we like to think that perhaps we are, however, but what does the word Caucasoid actually mean on the level of our interest? 
It means nothing more or less than a na native of the Caucasus. Now, the Caucasus is an area. Now, it's uh, very unlikely that most Caucasians of today have ever been there. But it represents to the anthropologist the seat of a type. To his thinking, the people of the Caucasus represent an almost perfect specimen of a kind of people. And he calls these people, therefore, Caucasians. Now, exactly where do the Caucasians live? And here we come into an interesting problem. We discover that the Caucasians inhabit Europe, North Africa, and Asia Minor. Now, we, uh, we might assume that they live in Brooklyn or Chicago, but when we move them into North Africa or into Asia Minor, we begin to have a little trouble with them because they are no longer the kind of people that we assume to be Caucasian. Yet they are. Because the Caucasian represents a whole series of factors. Essentially, these factors are determined by scales and by the development of certain basic cranial and other measurements by which we determine, not from appearance, but from structure, uh, the basic family to which a people may belong. Now, if we check uh, systematically into the subject, we will find, for example, an Arab. Now, this Arab may be almost any color you can think of, uh, from a very pale uh, olive shade, resembling somewhat a citizen of Sicily, or he may be practically Hebrew as far as the color of his skin is concerned. But you will always be able to distinguish him by the structure of his body and face and head. You will also be able to distinguish the way his hair goes and a number of interesting developments. One is known, by which he can never be mistaken for anything but what he is. And yet, as far as his clothing is concerned, his language is concerned, he certainly is not an immediate um, example of kinship with some gentleman uh, in uh, one of the English social sets. He is, he is not the same, but he is the same. Therefore, you look him up and you find that the Arab is a Caucasoid. He belongs to the same stock to produce the Greek, the Roman, uh, the late Persian, the Irishman, the Teuton, and the American. Now, we say the American because he is gradually coming into an identity. He is an example of something we're going to mention a little later, namely the noble polyglot. Now, among other interesting examples of the Caucasian is in all probability your Phoenician, your Chaldean, your Babylonian, these ancient gentlemen with long beards and high crowns that three, four, five thousand years ago reigned from their empires in the valley of the Euphrates. These were good Caucasians, yet time and consideration divide us very greatly from them. You look up in any work on anthropology, the word Semite and you will learn that it is a branch of the Caucasian race, something we have not ever thought about. Why? Because regardless of what this man believes, regardless of his cultural background as we know them, regardless of any other factor, he is bound into a pattern by genes and by the basic structure of his nature. So that we have, under the word Caucasian, a marvelous differentiation of possibilities. Now, the same is equally true of the Negroid type. The Negroid type we essentially regard as the basic type of the African people. However, he also extends into some rather remote and unexpected areas, showing up with a variety of attributes, but never can we mistake the basic structure of this particular group. A Mongolian is another. Now, our Mongolian is a, a very polyglot group, and he has had a tremendous influence. Actually, we know today 
that the Mongolian uh, group is great is larger than both the Caucasian and the Negroid put together, and also shows up in more places than even the Caucasian, regarding him as a trader, adventurer, and explorer. Actually, your Mongoloid, Mongol, Mongolian or Mongoloid is the most widely diffused and distributed of all your groups. Now, the moment we come to the realization of this, we come into another situation, which has been very well pointed out by anthropology. Namely, that at this time in our racial development of life, there is practically no possibility of differentiating either the racial or cultural descent of any people. This is, uh, therefore, one of the points that we must hold against all arbitrary division. The division is diagrammatic. It is not factual in experience. Uh, actually, the human race, as is said today, is none of these things, essentially. It is actually a kind of mongrel which has in it all of these elements. Now, how did these all these elements get there? First, to tremendous extent in time, and also due to the fact that in this course of time, all of these different groups at one state or another had a place in the sun. Uh, they did not always maintain this place in the sun, but every one of these basic groups was at one time or another dominant. And as a result of this dominance, gained enormous spheres of influence, and to a measure imposed their cultures upon other people. Now, wherever we have a dominant group, we find that dominant group extending not only culturally but racially into the bloodstream of subdominant groups. It always and inevitably occurs. Therefore, at an ancient and remote time, we find the Mongolian becoming a very powerful and dominant group. In more recent times, we have further evidence of the same thing at the time of the great campaigns of Genghis Khan and Kublai Khan. During the campaigns of uh, Genghis Khan, the Mongolian reached the boundaries of Europe and broke through in a number of areas. And as a result of, that, of this breakthrough, he is very strong racially among most of the Slavonic peoples and even as far as the Germanic. And there are a great many Germanic families that have Mongolian blood. Another important point of breakthrough uh, in more ancient times affecting the relationship between the Caucasian and the Negroid was the rise of the Ethiopian dynasties in Egypt. That during these dynastic periods, the Ethiopian kings ruled the world. As a result of that, they were not people of lesser estate. They were not regarded as in any re in a regard inferior. During this time, they filtrated throughout what we call most of the Caucasian area. And they certainly played a tremendous part in the rise of all cultures that were affected by the later Egyptian culture. These things are merely examples of a general trend. Now let us take a little different type of situation. Uh, we have uh, in the Pacific a very interesting and intriguing group of people we call the Japanese. Now from the standpoint of anthropology, they are a little bit of a mystery also because we have to recognize at least four levels of Japanese racial differentiation. The first is the X-ray, the original inhabitants of the island. And as most cases, the X-ray doesn't count very much. It uh, more or less disappears. It is either submerged into or in one way or another disposed of by the rising tide of other racial motion. The second group that uh, is still comparatively powerful in the Japanese area and contributed to the molding of what we call the modern Japanese was the Korean Manchurian racial division of the Mongolians. They contributed considerable uh, to a certain type of Japanese that can still be identified dominant of this characteristic. A 
In addition to the Korean Manchurian, there was a direct motion from the purely Chinese Mongolian into this area, which is marked by another differentiation, also in this case, essentially Mongolian. The third group comes from an entirely different basic culture order and is called, usually, the Malaysian-Indonesian culture, which represents, in many instances, the small, slight body and the tremendous agility and grace and many of the psychological structures of these people, including the native faith, as it is called, of Japan, Shintoism which is strongly influenced by Indonesian and uh, Malaysian culture. These people represent in turn a polyglot involving other factors going back and back and back. So we now have a people that represents a coming together and combination of at least three racial and three major cultural trends imposed upon a primitive group. Now, in your Indian situation, your East Indian situation, your anthropology is also rather complicated. There was an X factor or a basic people in India at a very remote time, and we call the Dravidians. The Dravidians were apparently the natural occupants of the great area which we now call the indo gangetic Plain. These people were a comparatively simple uh, group whose cultural program we will also have to consider because there is a major difference between simplicity and inferiority, and we have got to clear that up somewhere along the line. And that, again, is not an easy one. But with the coming of the Arya Hindu, Arya meaning the lords or the rulers or the anointed or the destined ones, we find the gradual submergence of Dravidian culture. Where, then, do we find that Dravidian culture in the Hindu <coughs> culture? We find it at the bottom, or at the innermost part. And yet, from this primitive source springs, perhaps, some of the most powerful influences in the forming of later Hindu and Indic life. As, for example, the tremendous binding tie between the Aryan and the Dravidian as found in the Rig Veda, which is the oldest, of the great books of Indian law. Now, where the area came from is, again, a matter of cultural problem. And here's one that we can't solve in terms of anthropology, because we can't come to any common ground with them. Actually, according to the Eastern states, and these are the people involved, the Aryas came down originally from the trans Himavas, or that area of India which lies south of the great Siberian stretch and uh, north of the common country of India as we know it, in the area now largely uh, the region of the Himalaya Mountains. The high plateaus of these mountains are said to have originally been the home of a people, which because of the very environment in which they lived and because of the tremendous racial pressures within them, were a far more active people than those living south in a more tropical climate, and gradually, in extending their power downward, they conquered or dominated the entire area and finally forced the Dravidians either to accept them or to run before them, which some did, and took their final refuge on the island of Ceylon. All this tremendous picture represents drives of ancient people. Uh, whether this occurred, as the East Indian believes, perhaps a million years ago, or whether it occurred 50 or 100,000 years ago, the legend, the lore, the tradition seems to make certain that it did occur or exist. But if we go back now to our anthropological viewpoint, and of course, let us face it, we can't reconcile. Because if you look up Aryan in modern anthropology, you will gain an answer that you might not expect at all, namely that the Aryan is one of the divisions of the Caucasian race. Now, the, uh, the reason for this standpoint, apparently, is that the anthropologist does recognize that the Aryan is the same bloodstream as the Anglo-Saxon. That although he is on the opposite side of the world, 
that he wears a turban, he is still one of us. Something that we sometimes uh, fail to remember, and uh, perhaps we can be excused for a brief detour because of an interesting thing that happened some years ago in this country, which has a bearing upon general ignorance of anthropology. And that is that when the uh, Maharaja Gaikwar of Baroda, one of the greatest of the Indian princes, came to this country to attend the World Fellowship of Faith during the time of the last great Chicago Exposition, he engaged a complete floor in a prominent hotel. The hotel refused to put him up because he was not a Caucasian. And as a result of that, and in order that he might not be further embarrassed, he bought the hotel. <laughs> now this... <laughs> and because he was a Caucasian, he sold it a few weeks later at a profit. <laughs> so you can, you can have your own viewpoint on these matters. But the, uh, the fact remains that while anthropology has the attitude that the Aryan moved from the Caucasus into Asia. The Hindu has the attitude that the Aryan moved down from the north. Whereas uh, the old Persian culture would have a tendency, I think, to suspect that what we call this grand motion actually began in the general area of the Near East. So that Persian culture would probably come a little nearer to agreeing with modern anthropology than would be more ancient Hindu culture. But here, out of this, we have only been doing all these ramblings for one essential purpose, namely to point out that nearly all of the boundaries which we have set up, by which we can arbitrarily distinguish between people, these boundaries are boundaries of words. They are also boundaries of ideas not thought through or not enlightened by available general information. They represent, therefore, to some degree, a limitation of perspective. And with this recognition, the anthropologist of today is ever less willing to commit himself on any of these subjects. He is afraid of words for the reason that nearly all these words have become semantically unfound and therefore fail to convey the principle which he wishes to convey. Actually, it has, as he says, it is relatively impossible to differentiate today any culture and associate it exclusively with a race. Culture is far more democratic than structure, and it has cut through structure on almost every front where development has taken place. So as we have identified the possibility of one race gradually individualizing within itself according to certain great universal laws, a triad of basic racial processes, we may also assume, without any particular data of being inaccurate or unscientific, one basic language breaking gradually into a triad of basic languages which begin to emerge. And finally, one basic culture which gradually breaks up into a triad of culture groups so that this entire process begins and develops upon a one-three formula. And this formula is to be traced and is traceable in almost every part of our cultural world. So now we want to pass for a moment to the, to the cultural phase of this emergence of racial uh, groups and things of that nature. And the next problem then that comes to us is the effort to determine relative advancing culture. Because essentially, we think of evolution as evolution in culture. We do not think of it as evolution in race. One reason being that evolution or change in culture is within historic records. Therefore, we may observe at least historic records of it. Whereas evolution in race is so vast and incredible a procedure that any amount of it that we can bring within comprehension is too small a fragment to be representative of any certain indication. 
in order to have any concept of evolution in race, clear concept, we would have to be able to examine the clear and certain records of at least a half a million or a million years. So this we cannot do. But we observe that cultures move more rapidly. Therefore, we are able to do more with them. And uh, we must not be deceived by what we consider to be surviving aboriginal racial groups. Uh, aboriginal groups, as we know them today, are far removed from the original, even though we are inclined to uh, compare them with other groups and doubt their superiority, or at least uh, doubt uh, their ability to survive adequately in the general culture of prevailing times. So what is the basis by which we shall determine culture? Now, culture, I do not necessarily mean a refinement. We speak of persons of culture. This is not the usage which I wish to make of it. I wish to use it in the terms of the cultural pattern by which people live. Those who attain harmonious adjustment with their cultural pattern are termed culture. But the pattern is far more ancient and more basic. There is no doubt in the world that the basic cultural pattern it's like the basic language and the basic race, has been submerged, still lies at the root of all culture groups, and forms the beginning, the seed, from which all the differentiated cultures of man arise. These cultures are therefore variations upon a theme, and the theme itself remains essentially unchanged. In determining culture, then, we have also another problem, namely the effort to determine the status of the individual by his culture and the status of the culture by the individual. Therefore, we like to say a primitive individual and a primitive culture. And we would feel in a very unhappy situation if we found a truly primitive individual who did not have a primitive culture but had some other kind. This would be considered an anomaly and would be hard to understand. Dr. Margaret Mead, who has been one of the most interesting and prominent of modern anthropologists, has come to a number of very interesting findings on the subject of basic culture. The difference between simplicity and ignorance. The difference between basic culture and unfolded culture. Also, the essential difference between culture and decadence. And these things are terribly important in, ter in determining the growth and development of the human race. We realize in some mysterious way that life is a motion from childhood or childishness to maturity and on again to childlikeness. We have an essential instinctive realization that value is simple. And it is that which is not valuable and is complex. On that basis, we have to approach the simple person with a little different attitude from, which, from that with which we are commonly uh, aware. The first point is that true knowledge is actually the knowledge of what to do now. This becomes a tremendously essential factor in knowledge. Another form or phase of knowledge is that it is the ability, the intellectual resource necessary to fulfill the purpose for living. Outside of this essential pattern of knowledge, there is a great deal of exaggerated knowledge, much of which is essential foolishness in disguise. So our anthropologists attempting to determine value must determine the difference between learned and unlearned foolishness and also learned and unlearned wisdom. Because culture is a central value, not assumed value. And an anthropologist would say definitely that the fact that man makes a satellite to go around the moon run around the earth, has nothing to do with culture and does not advance him culturally one iota. But when man ends juvenile delinquency, 
He has made a major step forward in culture. That an individual is rich has nothing to do with culture. The fact that that individual has a harmonious home in which there is no argument or infidelity, that is culture. That an individual uh, shall uh, be successful, advancing his own purposes, has nothing to do with culture. The degree to which he is unselfish for the common good is culture. Now, these are the differences. Therefore, it is quite possible for a Hottentot to be on a high platform of culture and a highly educated so-called Caucasian on a low level of culture. How are we going to determine culture? Now, you can argue this point for a long while and come up with a variety of solutions. Uh, Dr. Mead, in her researches among a group of people in the island of New Guinea, a little isolated group of about 1,500 families, discovered that these primitive people had as part of their essential cultural platform a very simple fact, namely, that in the family, the general tendency has been to forget the father to make him independent too soon of responsibility for the child. So according to their philosophy of life, the father is held equally responsible for the development of the child before and after birth and must perform constant ritual until the child is five years old in order that this child shall have a proper maturity. As a result of that, the father works as hard as the mother psychologically and religiously, through prayer, through fasting, through service, through keeping an equal watchfulness with the mother, taking every possible part in the life of that child, washing it, dressing it, doing everything that the mother does for five years, in order that that father shall always have the realization that he played a great part in the life of that child. The result is they have a certain problem in their social system which they have solved and we have not. Namely, the recognition of the importance of both parents and absolutely no competition. No competition in the home, says the old priest of that tribe, means no crime among the children. Now, what shall we say about his culture platform? Shall we say that we can compare that with a sniff to the graduate of Oxford or Cambridge? What is culture? That is the question the anthropologist must answer, and it's not nearly as easy as you think. It finally leads him to the inevitable conclusion that culture is non-comparative, that you cannot compare culture. You can only compare deficiency of culture. You can only say that the individual who lives well has more culture than the individual who does not live well. That the individual who is innately honest is higher on the level of culture than the individual who is not. We may say that a, a more complicated civilization makes the practice of primitive virtues increasingly difficult. The anthropologists will say yes, but it also makes available greater and greater knowledge by means of which we should be able to compensate for this difference. Therefore, essential culture rises from a series of factors, and these factors are perhaps as vital and even more important than racial divisions in determining the proper classification of mankind. I think most anthropologists would like to divide men into two classifications. One, those in which culture is sufficient, and those in which culture is insufficient. Now, this does not mean that the man of the given uh, must be measured in terms of what would be sufficient for the culture of the man of the given. The question always is, is it sufficient for the man of the given? Also, is the culture of the American citizen sufficient for the needs of the American citizen? Therefore, we divide now into two groups, culture and unculture. The unsulted is in the individual who lives below the threshold of his own needs, culturally speaking. 
The focus person is one who lives on the vessel of his own nature. There is only this division in nature. All other divisions are purely arbitrary and are purely the result of a psychology of dominance. They become part of what might be psychologically termed the attitude of racial arrogance. But all nature combines against it and tells us that the most precious gift that nature can bestow is his orderly survival. It bestows all the individual who is culturally sufficient to his own needs and is a platform upon which he stands. On this basis, then, the development of culture becomes a process of bringing into action what might be termed the great tribal or racial national conviction. Now, in primitive people, this conviction is largely embodied in myth, legend, lore, and ritual. This will be primarily the continuance of certain religious concepts. These concepts being primarily intended for one purpose only, and that is the preservation of the power of the collective culture. This is what it is all aimed at. Out of this then we come to the realization that man's only instrument of culture has been his religion in some form or in whatever division or policy or way of life that he is known. Up to the present time we have noticed uh, that many people have a religion which has strongly outdistanced them in one direction or another. Most individuals are either trying to live up to it or are trying to live down to it. When you outgrow a belief and try to hold on to it, you must lose down to it. When your belief is beyond your comprehension, you have to try to live up to it. Both of these procedures are painful. Therefore, both of these procedures are essentially non-cultural. That is another point in connection with culture. Culture is not man aiming at the impossible. Culture is not man living tomorrow, nor is it man living yesterday. It is man living well today, with the certainty that upon the foundation of today being a satisfactory experience in the fullest sense of the word, uh, yesterday can be gradually forgotten and tomorrow will be no problem when it comes. But the great difficulty with non-culture is the individual who is living out of the now. And as he lives out of the now, he awakens a series of mechanisms within himself. Among these mechanisms are his guilt factors, which can be very powerful to him and are the principal causes of his neurosis. All these problems involve more of culture than of psychology, although the two problems very closely relate together. To the anthropologist, psychology as a problem science a science of the human problem is actually a derived from a grand era relating to anthropology. You would expect, of course, the anthropologist put his ideas first, every science does. But he has a certain point. Namely, that the psychological problem of man arises from his lack of anthropological knowledge. That the uh, individual is trying to be what he is not is the fourth trouble. And he will continue to do this and have this trouble until he discovers what he is and lives accordingly. And this kind of, uh, of reasoning is essentially very simple. Simple culture has experienced among so-called natural people. Simple culture is not deficient in any of the values with which we are normally concerned. Simple culture is not unmoral, nor is it immoral. Simple culture probably has the greatest morality of all because it is completely honest. Uh, simple culture is not restrictive. It is not dogmatic. It is not fanatic. Simple uh, culture is essentially honest because it has discovered what we do not know, that honesty is the only way in which individuals can live together. Everything else is an illusion and a delusion leading only to us. So we have uh, what might be termed basic ethics arising 
form anthropological social sources. Man's great experience has been to get along with them, and those who have achieved this harmonious have learned certain essential lessons, and these essential lessons form culture. Culture is the result of the experience of man with man, the inevitable contact of relations. These cultural facts are far more evident to so-called primitive man than they are to us, because under our way of life, we have deluged our living with so many artificial considerations that we are no longer able to deal directly with any problem. The result of this, our culture is continuously collected. And uh, the proof of the breaking down of culture is the failure of the human social unit to hold together. It is the inability of the individual to so live that the essential values of this culture remain healthy. The moment they become un un unhealthy, he is endangering not only his own survival, but the survival of his entire being. So here in anthropology, we have this uh, important test, namely that all estimation of culture is non competitive It is absolutely based upon essential values. And this, in turn, is based upon archaic values. If you go back through, for instance, your great religious systems of the world, it is astonishing how close the ethics and morality of these faiths correspond. It is also amazing in the degree that these in turn are identical with the basic beliefs of those primitive people who have never yet emerged into the structure of great social or religious institutions. The American Indian, wandering in small bands on the plains of our southwest, had just as clear an insight into a social value as is to be found in the cult of the Simeon, Moses, or Amorabi. He had learned something that we do not realize, namely that culture is imposed upon man by the universe. That in certain essential things, men must follow or obey. That their relationships are invariably subject to certain pressures. That these pressures are not met with an adequate attitude. These pressures will destroy the cultural structure of that people. So behind all of our faith lies certain simple experience discoveries, made possible by the fact that we are a common people. And that as a common people, we never have had but one religion. That as a human being, we have never had but one culture. And all the differentiations upon it are comparatively superficial structures. Now we can build upon basic cultures as far as we can. And every generation we hope to build further. We hope to enrich the cultural life of man by giving him knowledge, skill, understanding, vision, insight, through the development of music and art and literature and poetry and theater, through all these things, we hope that we shall gradually move man further and further as a cultural entity in which value will be the dominant keynote of existence. But men will inevitably seek that which is value and will cling to that above every other consideration. This, more or less, is the golden vision of culture. Yet just as surely as our language is built upon the foundation of a pattern of words which are still to be found concealed within it, and even grammar and rhetoric are indebted to the laws governing these ideas for their development in the development of modern languages. So surely, man never outgrows basic culture. He merely specializes. 
to me develop an unfold of future. We say that no one knows what is lost within them. That there may be a million times more in him than we have ever found. Yet whatever is in him is in him because of the total nature of himself. The same is true of culture. Culture as we know it today is assuredly by no means complete. And the anthropologist who likes to think in these terms would like to view the hope, rather optimistically, that a hundred thousand, half a million, or a million years from now, man will look back upon his present culture and recognize its basic imperfection, that he will have gone on beyond it. But though he may outgrow one cultural system after another, he can never change the basic elements of culture as these elements exist. Therefore, all cultures are various improvisations upon the theme culture, and never can get beyond it. No advanced culture becomes greater by rejecting old culture. It may reject what has passed for culture and never was. But anything that was ever essentially true in culture will go on to become more glorious, to unfold greater potential. But a sense of culture never has to be destroyed in order that man may grow. Only false culture. It is the observation, the distortion, uh, the mistaken attitude toward culture which must be cleared away. Today, it would be our attitude that if our interpretation of culture fails, then our culture would fail. But that is not necessarily true. It might be that our, the failure of our interpretation of culture might assist us to recover a sense of culture. These points are, are very large in the thinking of anthropology because if they have to do with the essential values. So we go to the more primitive people to find out what constitutes a sense of culture. We find that these people instinctively possess attitudes. But these attitudes they do not explain. They do not interpret. They do not claim that they are even virtues. Most of these people have a very dim attitude toward virtue and vice. They have not been indoctrinated as to the particular ways in which they can be wrong. Therefore, the thought has not occurred to them. These people simply have learned from the daily experience of intimate contact with life and nature the simple rules necessary for themselves. If they follow these rules, they observe the prosperity, convenience, and security that results. If they break these rules, they observe disaster. Therefore, these rules become taboo or become patterns by which the community's conduct is regulated. One of the first things that men discovered was the quickest way to die was to think about only themselves. And there's exactly a primitive person in the world who has ever attempted to make a virtue or to justify selfishness. This has to come in at a time when the involvement of living becomes so complicated that the immediate result of a cause is not apparent. In a simple society, where cause and effect follow so closely that they cannot be misunderstood, the common fault that we practice cannot exist. It only exists with us because we can dump them into an ocean of thought in which the mistakes and errors of millions of others can be stirred into our own, and we can lose sight of where responsibility rests. Therefore, we can seriously blame somebody else for our own mistakes. Primitive man cannot do it. In fact, he seldom survives to blame anybody if he makes a mistake. Therefore, his entire attitude toward life is very different. An anthropology working with these problems attempts to determine what constitutes Value. We think of terms of course that value is the value. We know that this gives we years at a very remote time. That there is an instinct in man to survive. 
But we also know that this instinct was almost immediately supplemented by another one. Sacrifice. And almost as far back as we can go in our human thinking, even among the most primitive people, we find a value above survival. And that value slowly molds itself into the concept of honor. Survival is less important than honor. Because the honorable man can live with himself. Whereas the man is not honorable cannot. Therefore, to survive at the expense of honor is to continue miserable, which itself is no reward. Primitive people then generally consider are uh, less selfish, less arrogant, less self-centered than what we call civilized people. Because in their daily experience they can see the mistakes of these attitudes. We cannot. This leads the anthropologist to point out that there is a basic code which we have lost sight of and which we must rediscover. And the point where it can be both easily discovered and examined is among so-called primitive people. Thus are tremendously increasing interest in them. Because they represent a level of value which we have so completely obscured that it is no longer acceptable to us. Now, in continuing our problem of race and language and religion, we come to a very important episode in the development of human life. And that was the gradual unfolding of what we would term spoken language in the written form. We do not actually know who invited, invented writing. We are assuming, however, that it belongs to a gradual unfolding from Christopher and hieroglyphic forms of ancient knowledge. We know that at a remote time, man began to devise symbols. The three symbols were largely diagrammatic, crudely made representations of objects. And that for a long time, we had no skill whatever in creating and saying word forms. He could not put life in them. He could only regard them as objects. And in, that, in his effort uh, to transmit abstract ideas, he found himself in the beginning most unhappily restricted. Perhaps one of these uh, elements of this particular circumstance led to the gradual development of a psychological attitude in him. Namely, that things valuable could not be written. And things written had only a certain kind of value. Certainly we know that from the very early time, matters which had to do with spirit, with soul, with God, with the great principles of things, were never written. We also know that in those times later, the men symbolically began to associate bowels with life energy, which they did. But it was customary for them not to like these bodies, but only to have them figuratively in their own minds to be inserted in the writing by the reader himself. This was one of the peculiarities of the very early Hebrew writing. We also know uh, that the effort to bring words to life resulted in a gradual change from a hieroglyphical or pictorial form uh, to the hieratic form of a gradual increase in language symbol by making these symbols equivalent to sounds rather than to things. The natural division of these sounds, as Landa attempts to show us in the development of his concept of the Maya language, uh, these sounds probably originally were the names of the things pictorially represented. Therefore, the sound for a picture was at least the beginning of the name of the thing for which the picture represented. It was then, however, discovered that by putting several pictures together and using their sound, other concepts which had no pictorial equivalent could be transmitted. 
And in Egypt, this became most commonly associated with proper names, in which by placing the script in a cartoon, they were read no longer as symbols, but as symbols. This is an instruction and an example of man searching for written sound. With the rising of written sound, a very interesting thing took place in the anthropology of man. We say there was nothing that was more important to man in the discovery of writing. We just love to glamorize that magnificent event. But when we do this, we lost them. Whenever we do anything in this world, we lose it. The thing that we lost very largely was the strange acuteness of memory, which is previously we had been endowed in order to protect the idea. We lost the intimacy of the great storyteller. We lost the bars. We lost the ancient and valued ancestors. We could communicate his language and his thoughts only directly to other persons by speech. We began to create a new anthropological world in which knowledge was divided from people and became a matter of being recorded on stone, tablets of wax, papyrus, parchment, or paper. Thus, knowledge suddenly went cold, like the medium on which it was placed. We lost a dimension of transmission. Perhaps that's one of the reasons why today we have an instinctive love of fear. It's because it has something to do with the living transmission of ideas. Something went sour in the development of written words. It was the living impression. Words are not only according to their letters and their syllables. But they are according to a life moving behind the breath. And in all kinds of transmission, there is a factor of the holy breath, the breath of life, carrying those words. It meant something. It meant something on a purely physical basis. It meant what the Iroquois calls to the render, the transference of a spirit rather than merely a picture. The men became more and more indebted to history. They became more and more conscious that ideas could be passed around in books. And they forgot that in the transmission of ideas, there was a tremendous individuality. The old storyteller never told his story twice before. He told it according to the need of the hour. He told it and he made a certain emphasis according to the nature of the person who sought to instruct their involved. He made a lesson of it in every instance. And it was the lesson about the subject, rather than the subject of the book itself, that became the aura of culture relating to that thing. And the discovery of writing and the instruction of all of man's ideas to almost unchanged written form, blocked the living transmission of knowledge. It blocked the individual from having this knowledge forever contemporary. If we had Plato today descending through a hundred generations of people, people only all of them, we might not know quite so much about what Plato said that it probably got a little out of order in the course of time. But we would have a more living power of Plato of moving into our lives, the others living in our time. We would have the opportunity to add to the original 2,500 years of constant living descent of ideas. This could be a very important question, and perhaps we will help to solve it at some degree at least by our increasing recognition of the importance of visual instruction and visual education. Perhaps our television will help us to capture something of the body, something of the living transmission of things visible, rather than always depending upon their abstract statements 
because we cannot be thinking they invoke the same idea within ourselves. We cannot talk to the book. We cannot act to the book. We can only accept. Constantly accept. And in this way, we lost a tremendous dimension of cultural life. The only question we must then for a moment and ask is the descent of races. Now, in the philosophical system, we have, as we have noticed before, the story of a descent of races, much as we might have a descent along a long stairway or ladder. We assume, for common purposes, that of our three races, that there are the two groups that we have mentioned, that the Negro corresponds with the ancient Lemurian race, that the Mongo Mongoloid corresponds to the Atlantean race, and the Pocetoid corresponds to the Aryan race. Now this, you know, is a very interesting thing, but it got us into some trouble. One of the places where it got us into an obvious bit of trouble was in Germany during the last war. Because this idea of the descent of races had had an effect upon natural psychology. And it had a very important part in play, a part to play in the development of the natural concept of hyperarianism. It was very largely supported and substantiated by this so-called ladder of races that had been developing around metaphysical systems of thought. And uh, the principal educational leader of Germany at that time was a member of one of these esoteric groups that had taught this ladder of races, and he said it was very convenient. It was used against the very things he would want to have it used for. But it became a very, very dangerous thing. Because it began to take a very dangerous attitude, namely the competition for racial superiority. It began to take the attitude of the latest to the best, and that all other ancient races had been had had their days in the sun, were disappearing, and that the world was now seeking in the keeping of the mighty Aryan force. This led to a very bad problem on the level of culture. It, it was used against itself, and uh, has brought out an evil which uh, your anthropologists have been quick to learn because he recognized it long before it even became a problem on a religious level at all. Namely, the difficulty of trying to determine these descent in terms of relative value. So out of it all, uh, the anthropologist has come to a conclusion. Namely, that the human problem is not essentially a man of faith. Human progress is essentially built upon an entirely different foundation, namely the strength of a culture to induce the growth of an individual. Wherever he is placed in a cultural pattern, it is this cultural pattern that very largely determines what he will use, how fast he will grow, how bright he will be, and how so-called superior he will become. But these factors are not necessarily intrinsic in the so-called racial differentiation. That the cultural factor is its effect upon the life of the individual inducing him to excel himself by a series of continual motions. Not to an outstripping to the degree that he cannot catch up, but gradually to challenge him more and more to release or reveal values within himself. Experiments have been made on a number of different levels to determine the validity of this concept. And most of these experiments have held up on the level of essential culture. So they have not necessarily held up on the level of a theme culture, such as specific forms of knowledge. Therefore, man has a common knowledge and a specific knowledge. 
these two may not agree. But we must not and should not assume that lack of specific knowledge is an indication of deficiency of common knowledge or the essential knowledge that knows the need to surface This essential knowledge, which also has locked within it the potential of almost every type of specialization under appropriate cultural incentives. Therefore, culture is not only this pattern, but it is a progressive unfoldment of incentives. And the trouble has been not that the individual did not have capacity in most instances, it is that he lacked incentive, that he lacked the circumstances around him by which certain demands were made upon his own anthropological complex. Thus, for example, if he was never under a challenge, whatever was necessary to meet such a challenge never came out of himself. This happened in the case of the Inca of Peru. These people, isolated on the Western Hemisphere in the southern part of it, never developed any adequate international cultural concept. They had no idea of anybody but themselves, because they had never seen anything or anyone except these little groups that were not even on their level of culture at that time. The result was that a handful of Spanish and a dozen horses overthrew an empire, simply because there was no way to meet the sudden impact out of experience. This type of situation simply means that within the Inca state there had been a cultural specialization. And as we study their policy, we study their ethics, we study their morality, we are lost in admiration for them because they were a magnificent people. But they have never developed the ability to meet any data. They simply did not know how to accept such a challenge with the young man's spirit. This was essentially true also in Mexico, although perhaps not quite as complete, still very large. So that we have cultures only developing according to certain conditions. These conditions begin to bring in outside elements which we have to uh, consider. These include environment, locality, uh, isolation or proximity to other people, the culture of islands is very different from the culture of continents. Also, you will recognize that your great cultural motion have always arisen in your largest areas of land. Because in these enormous areas, you have variety of demand. You also have proximity of a variety of neighboring circumstances and conditions. Therefore, we learn as a basic principle that culture advances most rapidly in a polyglot society, inasmuch as it presents greatest talent. But this does not necessarily mean that all motion within a polyglot is culture or is advanced. Not only is culture or advanced, by which advancement is actually attained on a culture level. But we do observe that uh, the great racial motion, the great religious motion, the great language motion, all begin on large land areas. Because here you have a comparatively complicated way of life only forced upon the individual. Now we will also point out that this forcing of a way of life of one type of group upon another has produced stress. And out of this stress has arisen most of the trouble in society. So we might say, as the persons have said to me, that if they were all by themselves, they could get along all right. And there was a great rush in not to uh, get in trouble and still have other people around. Thus, in your development of culture, you see a primary problem in this. And this primary problem has resulted in the bloody history which we know as that of mankind. The problem of eternal conflict. Yet essentially, this conflict uh, is non-cultural. And every factor involved in it has always known this, but has not known what to do about it. 
This also means that gradually your cultural motion has to reintegrate. And this is what uh, your anthropologist is hoping to see happen. He is hoping that he may not live to see this occur, but may live to see a few more symptoms about it appear. The man begins to recognize the need of a conscious reunited of his resources, no longer by arbitration or by arbitrary decision, but out of experience with his repulsion. Thus, world peace is a cultural goal, because it can only be achieved by cultural means, and it can only be achieved by the individual attaining individual maturity, which is cultural integrity. There are laws and patterns which appear above the surfaces of these fields when you investigate them. But we are trying merely to summarize certain broad sheets of this particular problem. And we are therefore taking a culture as it stands today and taking your three great racial groups, so-called arbitrary, and your boundaries of racial variability, recognizing that all of these things have cultural history, which may be regarded as a series of ups and downs, which it has been all the way along. Let us recognize that this cultural pattern of each of these things has much more in it as subjective psychology than we realize. That the so-called primitive groups are really very old groups. And that the reason why we regard them as sacred is because their important discoveries were made perhaps before the dawn of history. That uh, they have an amazing maturity in them. One of the most completely material human beings that I have ever known is an Navajo Indian medicine man. He is a completely material thing. He has a maturity with nothing to take from it. He had the dignity of nature, not of man. He was completely lacking in all. He never needed to use words for more than one or two syllables, because he knew the right ones in his own language. And just as the words of Jesus seldom exceed two syllables, and yet within them is more wisdom than in great books, so the simple, natural directness of this man was a magnificent unfoldment of a true wisdom, coming from an isolated, arid region, where apparently there was no opportunity for her, for her life, but where a very good human culture had existed for ages and memorial. So we cannot be too hasty in assuming the history for that thing lacks culture, or lacks the capacity for culture. These people, perhaps some of them, lack the capacity to be misunderstood. Because of the simple directness, because generations of involvement in a psychosis before they would be sufficiently abnormal to be happy with our way of life. <laughs> but their simple values and their definition of value uh, would become a major point for us to look at. In all these things, therefore, particularly, arise out of cultural generality. And with every race and nation that's on the earth today, with a long and illustrious cultural history, much of which is totally unknown to their own people, much of which is culturally unrecognized by their own people. Just as sure as the culture of Greece and India is almost totally unrecognized by two thirds of the Caucasian race. It does not mean it isn't there. Modern anthropologists are taking more and more of the attitude that it is perfectly possible to assume that every human being on earth today, arising from a heterogeneous culture, that the average person having anywhere from five to twenty-five racial trees in his system. And it's almost impossible 
that a completely pure example of any race can be found, regardless of what we see. Let us take the Sita Angel Saxon, or Sita There is no genealogy of any European family available today more than 1,200 years ago. Beyond that, there is mystery. There is legend, and there have been some manufacturers, but actually, or in fact, it is easy to make it. We cannot do it. The average individual could not get up to bed and tell you the actual racial identity of his grandparents five generations in age. He's a pretty person, but he is a poor. A moral. Therefore, as these cultural genes have mingled in the biological descent we the Greek, we are in no position to say that there is any human being on the earth today other than one disease or in some way abnormal in whose nature the possibility of important cultural growth is not to be done. We cannot say that such a person is there. Nor can we say honestly that any person is totally limited by the culture pattern of the dominant race with which he is now identified. Because we have no way of knowing to what degree that race has already mingled with the other, producing an anthropological capacity for culture. We have no way of knowing. And rather than to try to argue this stuff and try to um, create a situation that at best can only be uh, objective, and upon which we can demonstrate nothing with factual sense. The modern tendency is to assume that the best thing that can happen for all is that this cultural basic pattern should be released, revealed in every possible way from the voluntary cooperation of mankind collected to the achievement of this pattern should be encouraged in every way possible. That it is through this common encouragement and the essential value that is to be found in all things that we are going to advance ourselves most rapidly. Our experiences of men like Lawrence of Arabia and others who went into comparatively remote areas, the Austrian uh, refugees who went to live in Tibet, and other people uh, like that Claudio Holmes who went over and lived for many years in Japan. Those people who go to these areas live among them are gradually but inevitably overwhelmed with admiration for the values in all these diversified areas. A man wrote not long ago that in his estimation, the noble standards of human conduct that he had discovered in a lifetime of wandering, he found in a small oasis in the Sahara Desert. Here was the thing we talk about being done. Well, we only talk. So the culture, from an anthropological standpoint, is the encouragement of recognition. The importance of building upon achievement. And the recognize an achievement from some place. In as much as achievement arises almost always from the polygraph, which has itself biologically transcended race. Achievement arises nearly always in a scheme in which there have been many meetings, thus creating apparently an important internal biological tolerance to our world. These points, then, cause us to say this, that there is all probability, or much to support the idea, uh, that races do the fear, as the ethic characters would like us to assume, and as we have to use the paper. Yet, these do the fear in some time as a secret, and that in this secret, which is undoubtedly an archetypal motion in the medical space, in which the individualization, which is present everywhere in the universe, 
took over its proper manifestation in the production of more. But these races do the world in a pattern, in a secret. But let us also realize that races, once the racial structure was established as a base, races were born out of races. Therefore, that races in every instance, according to the Hindu esoteric tradition, were the result of centralized groups arising in a previous way, possessing or perishing those advanced cultural instincts by means of which a new dispensation or a new way of life became proper and reasonable. That such a thing may have occurred, and probably did occur, there seems to be no, even no good anthropological reason to doubt that such could happen. And there has been no essentially better explanation of it. But this also tells us of something that even the materialist is inclined to admit. Namely, that when progeny arises within families and within race, this progeny always carries with it an essential element from its own ancestors. That if we wish to follow the scientific idea of natural salvation, and we do not wish to achieve immortality for man, I'm not saying that we should do it, but I'm saying if we wish to take the scientific way, then the answer to science officer is that the father lives in the son, and that this son in turn lives in his son, and that all continuum is through the continuum of the racial structure. If we wish to achieve this, and perhaps physically there is some ground for it, although metaphysically it is not a sufficient explanation, we then realize that ancient races never die. They vanish into their own descendants in each case. If, therefore, a first race finally vanished from the earth, it was because it was a thought, because its essential life culture was transmitted to another. Gradually, the forms may have disappeared, but the life of the race never died. The life of culture never dies, because culture is an unbroken tradition. But culture is always, in some way, carried by the bloodstream. Therefore, if there are races that we wouldn't even like to call friends anymore, some were most cannibal at a distant time, let us remember that actually, that ancient state of affairs did not cease. It simply unfolded. As one ancient Indian fable says, you look at the five-year-old child and you say, where is the man? And you look at the man and you say, where is the five-year-old child? The man looks very different from the five-year-old child, but the five-year-old child did not disappear to make way to the man. The five-year-old child is still in that man, but it has grown and developed beyond. It was not clear that a man might come. It was rather unfolded that the man might appear who was always there. Therefore, it's the first race, the Lemuria, seemingly uh, disappeared or became exceedingly decimated. It is simply because the small advanced cultural unit simply moved into it. A new race will form and continue. It is as it gradually reassumed. Uh, the Caucasian race, or taken dominance over the Atlantean or Mongolian race, the matter which, by the way, is a little under the seat of the man. Because at the present time, we are wondering just exactly what is the relationship between the Caucasian race and a vastly numerical overwhelming Mongolian race. Perhaps these people didn't have their place in the sun a million years ago and vanished forever. Perhaps they're going to show up again. Perhaps there are wisdom, there's wisdom in the words of scripture that the first shall be last. In any event, whatever moves into what we might term some higher order of cultural availability, or intellectual availability, or emotional availability, carries within it always that which went before. Just as sure as when our time comes to peace, 
and some better people to take things over, we will not speak. We will continue them, going on to contribute to their culture all of the intrusive and innate interests which we have accumulated in our long and fabulous adventure. This is the only way in which adventure becomes meaningless. It is the adventure of the cave man and the Neanderthal man is only meaningful because it made possible what exists now. The fact that these people struggled ages ago does not mean anything except in terms of certain basic values which uh, we have gradually come to understand or to know out of that primordial struggle. Thus the problem of the racial ascent is again one of specialization. And uh, we can think of the possibility that certain types seem to be more able to accept culture than others, as we know. But that means to accept our culture. And that is where the fact comes. Some people cannot accept our culture. They never will want it. Others, we cannot accept theirs. But this no longer becomes the basis of superiority and inquiry, but a specialization within great cultural generality. Regardless of what we have done, our primary goal will remain the same. Our goal is the goal of the cave namely that we want to be happy. We want to be secure. We want to be loved. We want to be understood. We want to change the world for our children. We want to know how to provide for the needs of our own existence. And instinctively, we have an impulse to share with those whose needs are greater than our own. These are the basics. These have never changed. And all that we are attempting to do by two types of projects is to make these goals available, to make it possible for us to be these things that we have wanted to be from the dawn of time. The morality, ethics, philosophy, logic, all of these subjects exist only to help us to make these goals come true. And these goals, appropriate goals, are available and possible to all people. And in time, all people who are witness of that diversified experience will contribute to the ultimate and final statement of our cultural goals. Our music, our art, our literature. These things cut through all artificial social groups and bring us into a common humanity. To understand this, to serve it wisely, and to develop with understanding the solution to our own cultural needs, these things together constitute, it seems to be, the most vital part of the subject of anthropology. And so now we'll have to stop and go on next week.